scriptures say that God who created all things loves us and he desires to be our father. What does that exactly mean? Open with us to 1 John chapter 3. Follow along and find out. We bless you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. It is good to sing of the love of the Lord, to be reminded of his great love for us. While you are standing this morning, would you take out your Bible? If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will gladly bring you one. We are opening today to the letter, the first letter of John. First John chapter three is where we are at. John is right near the end of your Bible, so open to almost the end and you will find first, second, and third John, Jude, and then Revelation. John, first John three. 1 John 3, and we'll pick it up at verse 1, moving at lightning speed, making it a whole long ways here. So 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Father, we just sang of your great love for us. And I'm not sure that we fully comprehend the greatness of it, but I pray that as we look into this passage of scripture specifically, that you would enlighten us, Lord, that you would remind us, maybe, of the greatness of your love and that that reality would affect us at a deep level. Lord, that you would continue that transforming work that you begin first in our minds by your word, transform us by the renewing of our minds, that our lives would be a display of your good and perfect will. God, do a work in us, we pray. We pray all this in Jesus' name and all those that agreed said, Amen. You may be seated. Six years ago today, Andrea and I were sitting in a hospital room down at Kaiser in San Diego, Zion, waiting to be discharged after the birth of our our fourth little one, Elliot. Yesterday was Elliot's sixth birthday. And so we were there at the hospital. It was a Sunday, just like today. So I obviously wasn't able to teach. Somebody else was filling in for me, but we were down there at Zion waiting to be discharged. And I, besides that being the day that we were released to go home with little Elliot, that day sticks in my mind. I remember it quite clearly for, for two reasons. One, I remember very clearly sitting outside a hospital room as little Elliot was taken to have a little man procedure, you know, that they do with little boys. Uh, And as he was there, I was watching on my phone, I was watching the live service at the Rock Church, Miles McPherson teaching through the scriptures, a friend of mine, and just watching the scriptures as, you know, little Elliot came out very unhappy after that moment. So I remember that, um, just do. Uh, And then I remember also in the afternoon, six years ago today, I remember Andrea and I were waiting for them to finally come in and say, you can go. We were watching on TV while this complete nut job named Nick Walinda was walking a tightrope Maybe you remember this, it was, it was live on TV, walking a tightrope across a portion of the Grand Canyon. And we sat there like transfixed, like most people, just waiting for him to fall to his death. Because I'm terrible, really, I have a wicked heart. And, and we just sat there and my wicked heart was racing at like 150 beats per minute. We're just watching, like this is insane. This guy is absolutely nuts. And I, I remember it that day for that reason. Now those two things have nothing to do with this passage of scripture at all. I just they, I remember them. But being that we took home our fourth little child six years ago today, and being that last week was Father's Day, and being that this passage of Scripture before us is one of the most wonderful sections of Scripture dealing with a father and his children, particularly the fatherhood of God and we as his children. Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot read 1 John 3, verse 1 without hearing a little song in my head. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Right? Some of you know that song. We could sing it in a round if I was John Corson, but I'm not, so we won't. Um, But 
that song sticks in my head. So every time I read 1 John 3, 1, I hear that little song, that little tune in my mind. And frankly, I'm grateful that I know that song because it means that I know this verse by heart. And if you don't know this verse by heart, I would encourage you to remember it, to memorize it, to set it on a little three by five card or maybe record yourself reading it on your mobile device and listen to it a whole bunch to know this passage of scripture because it is an important passage of scripture that you should know and hold dear in your heart. Now, the verse just prior to this, the passage that Pastor Jason preached from last week, it ends with these words. Look one verse back, 1 John chapter 2, the last verse. It says, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So the practice of righteousness, and we're going to talk more about this in our next study together in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 and on. But the person who practices righteousness It's an indication, their practice of righteousness indicates that they are born of God because they are inheriting certain characteristics of righteousness that come from the Father. Righteousness is of Him. But John, he makes that comment, is born of Him. And in writing about being born of Him, John now exclaims in the very next sentence, Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Now, John previously had written the gospel according to John before writing this letter. And in John chapter 3, we have this famous conversation between a very religious man, one of the leading teachers of Judaism in Israel in the first century. His name was Nicodemus. And he came to Jesus by night to inquire of him. He had some questions. He was never able to get to the questions because Jesus totally interrupted him and said, you must be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God. And it totally tripped his circuits. He could not comprehend that. And they go back and forth on this whole thing of being born again. So there, Jesus introduces this concept of the new birth, of being born again. It's seen previously in John chapter 1, verse 12, also talks about being born again. So John, he has been taught, if you will, by Jesus, this concept of, since the very early days of his walking with Jesus. But now, some 60 years has passed. John, at the time that he writes this letter, 1 John, he's probably about 75 years old. And even though six decades of time or more has passed, John is still utterly blown away by the reality of the new birth. He is still absolutely amazed by the fatherhood of God and by the fact that we are called the children of God. This concept is still blowing John's circuits, if you will. The concept of the fatherhood of God and we being his children. And all of this according to the love of God. Now, I love my children very much. And I have loved them with a love that is almost hard to articulate fully. Since the moment they came into this world, it's an amazing thing. In fact, maybe it's a stretch to say it. I'm not entirely sure that it is. I'm not entirely certain that you fully comprehend the love that is described in the New Testament of the Bible under the word called agape. It's a Greek word, agape. I'm not sure we fully comprehend the the fullness of that word entirely until we become parents and we have children. There is a sacrificial component. There's a kind of love there between a a child and the parent between a parent and child that you only fully comprehend when you become a parent. So I I love my kids with that kind of love. And now I I think I could say in general, I, I love all kids, but not in the same way that I love my own kids. And parents, you understand this. There's a connection, a love that you have for your kids, for your parents, that is awesome, that is Great, and, and really, I love your kids insofar as they are nice to my kids, and then if they're not, I don't, I don't love them anymore. But, but we love our kids. There, there is this amazing connection, and I believe that God created this. He, he made us this way so that we would begin to comprehend this kind of love. And it's helpful as a Christian to step back and recognize the love with which God has loved us. Because you have a love for your children. I have a love for my kids. That is there instantly when they come into this world, a connection that 
is not easily broken. I would say it's very, very, very hard to break that love, even when they do things that bother me. And if you're a parent, you know your kids do things that bother you, like from day one, pretty much. Like that whole crying and, and you know, going to the bathroom all over the place. That, that's challenging. It can be annoying. You, so there are things that our kids do that challenge our love for them, but we still love them. And God has loved us with a love that is so much greater. He, he loved us when we were. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 says, we were children of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says, we were sons and daughters of disobedience. That's like a great name for a band, daughters of disobedience. So uh, <laughs> when we were children of wrath, sons and daughters of disobedience, God loved us. This is exactly what Jesus said to Nicodemus in that great conversation with Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse 16, the most famous translated verse of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The apostle Paul picks up on this in his letter to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 5, verse 7, he says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And John, at 70 plus years old, some six decades after learning of this love and the fatherhood of God, he's still blown away by it. Point number one on your sermon guide, God's great love has overshadowed the greatness of my sin. That's a good thing to meditate upon. To take that and just to think about it sometime today or sometime this week, that God's great love has overshadowed the greatness of my sin. Now, some of you, like me, grew up in church. And in growing up in church, you didn't really have a, a period of time where maybe you were what the Bible would describe as prodigal, wayward. But there's a significant number of you that came to faith in Jesus later in life after you had experienced prodigal living. And as a result of that, your concept of the greatness of God's love in spite of your sin may be greater than the person who grew up without that experience. Now, that's not to say that we don't, we don't fully enjoy the love of God, but there is a concept, concept, a conceptualization of the love of God that seems to be greater when a person has seen the greatness of the distance that they had run away from God and how he took care of that. And we sing of that Oh, how he loves us. When we're singing that last song we sang today, and for some of you, there's a real, a real stir of emotion in that worship because you realize the greatness of the love of God. Be that as it may, even if you haven't had that experience where you were wayward and you saw God come and pursue you to come, you know, there was a song and it caused a whole bunch of problems with people in the church because they have a hard time with the lyric, the, the reckless love of God, and they, they really stumble over that word. And, you know, that's for another study. I only have 28 minutes, so I can't get into that. But, um, but understanding that the way in which he has pursued us, it would appear, in one sense, to be pretty reckless, reckless in the way that he has pursued us. And we need to really grasp the fullness of his love. If you're not amazed by the love of God today, then I think it would be really valuable for you to do exactly what John says. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Take some time and consider it. Think about it. And maybe even pray, God, would you reveal to me, either through the pages of Scripture or in just a work of your spirit, the, the understanding of the greatness of your love? What kind of love gives the ultimate sacrifice for one that would be no better than an enemy? And not just no better than an enemy, one that is an enemy. Christ died for the ungodly. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will some die. Maybe for a good man some would dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for you and for me in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the demonstration of the love of God. Now this verse, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. I love how it's translated in another translation. I, I generally teach from the New King James Version, but the HCSB some refer to it as the hardcore Southern Baptist Bible. It translates this verse. Look at how great a love the Father has given 
us that we should be called God's children, period, and we are. Now, that little addition, and we are, why is that there? Well, it's there because there are different manuscripts from which translators translate the New Testament. There are many different manuscripts, over 25,000 different document evidences from the New Testament. And there are different manuscripts from which the King James and New King James are translated called Textus Receptus. And then there's another group of documents that are translated H HCSB. And they have this little addition, and we are. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and we are. Now, why is that little and we are important? Because... It, it speaks to us of this very important truth. We're not just called. It's not just a mere title that we've been given, the children of God. We are the children of God by adoption, by God's grace. This is according to the spiritual blessings that God has given to us. Paul writes about them in his letter to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 1, that we have received every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And one of those is adoption. Adoption to be fully-fledged members of the family of God. You're not just called a child of God. When you put your trust in Jesus, you are a child of God. What kind of love makes an enemy a child? Only a divine love can do that. And this is who we are presently. If you have put your trust in Jesus today. Now, as an important side note to that, if you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, to be found in Christ according to the love of God by grace, to be adopted and redeemed as sons and daughters of God, then you are what Ephesians chapter 2 says, a child of wrath, a son or daughter of disobedience. That's a frightful thing. There is a clear separation, a clear difference. But if you have put your trust in Jesus, you are a child of God. And this speaks to identity. One of the most fundamental philosophical questions that every human being to really be able to experience life as it is intended to be needs to answer this deep question of identity. There's five important questions, I think, that we philosophically need to answer. That of identity, purpose, origin, destiny, and morality. And this one identity is extremely important. And we see this around us. Because we're living in a culture right now that the pop culture and secular education for a very long period of time has raised an entire Western culture to not really have a good basis for identity. So you people, see people who are confused about identity. And it's a very devastating, sad situation. Our hearts should break for those people who are struggling, wrestling with this question of identity. And you will always wrestle with this question of identity until you come to the reality of identity in Christ. Now, this identity, we are the children of God, it presents for us a dilemma. And dilemma may not be the best word. I, I was wrestling over the right word, and dilemma works, maybe a challenge. But there is a challenge, and John identifies it in the second half of 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, then this, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. There's the dilemma. Point number two on your outline. God's great love separates me from the world. When we receive the love of God to become the children of God, there is a separation. If you are a child of God, you are estranged at a certain level from this world, which presents a challenge. It presents a dilemma because why? We're still in this world. But Jesus even says, we're not of this world. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you've experienced the tension between these two realities. You have a new identity in Jesus. You're not of this world. You're of the Father, but you're still in this world. And it's a challenge. And it's a challenge because though we may not recognize it or admit it or even accept it, we, we don't really like a certain part of us doesn't really like to be estranged from this world. Why is that? Because there's a certain part of us. I believe I could make the case, the argument that this certain part of us is what the New Testament calls our flesh, our old nature. There's a certain part of our old nature that wants to fit in. 
In fact, Abraham Maslow, he was a psychologist in the 20th century, he identified this in what's commonly referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There is a need that human beings have to be a part of a group, an in-group. This actually is what is fueling what is being called identity politics in our nation today. And there's a lot of different groups that are catering to this part of our nature, trying to get groups. And we, from our youngest experience of life, we want to be a part of the crowd, in the group. This is why some of you really hated kickball in elementary school or dodgeball, because you didn't get picked. And I'm very sorry, but maybe you experienced that. So we have this deep desire to not be on the outside. We want to be a part of the group. And there's a part of us that loves the things of this world. Now, as the scriptures see it, there, there really are only two kinds of people in this world. There are those who are of this world and there are those who are of the kingdom. And those who are of this world are estranged from the kingdom of God, and those who are of the kingdom of God are estranged from, separated from this world. There is no in-between, between these realities. And because you and I still are in the world and we still carry with us this nature, what the Bible describes as flesh, even though we are born of the spirit of God according to the love of God and we are called children of God, we have a new identity, we have this part of us that wants to fit in, that does not want to be outside. And John, the author of this letter, he knew this. Now, sometimes we can exalt guys like John and the other apostles on kind of a pedestal. We go, well, they are apostles. Yes, he was an apostle, but he's just a human being as well. He had similar experience of life that we do. He just had the privilege of being able to see Jesus in the flesh and see the risen Jesus. And he was an apostle sent by Jesus, but he's still a guy like us. He still experienced the struggle. Hashtag, the struggle is real. We, we all have that. This difficulty, and John is writing to a group of people who had this as well, this part of their nature that loves the things of this world. That's why he would write. We, we saw this several weeks ago in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Just look back a few verses. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. You only give an exhortation to people to not love the world if there is an inclination in them to love the world. If you had no tendency, no inclination to love the things of this world, there would be no need for an exhortation, a command, do not love the world or the things of this world. But every single one of us love this world and the things of this world because we are in this world, though we're not of this world, because we have a new identity in Christ. And so we have this conflict. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we should not love it. Why? Verse 17, the world is passing away. And the love of it, the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So being that we have this inclination, this struggle in our nature, our flesh, to love the world and the things of this world, to go after the lust of the eyes, the lust of the, light, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, Sometimes we need this important reminder. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. He reminds us of our identity. Beloved, we are the children of God. Point number, two, point number three on your outline. By God's great love, I have been joined to him as a child. And it's not that we will be children of God. You see, some of you came from a certain faith background where you believed or were taught that you have to do a certain series of things to then be called the child of God. You have to follow some certain rules. You have to be baptized in a certain way. You have to partake of the sacraments in a certain way and observe all these different things, and then you will be called a child of God. So you lived your whole life trying to live up to, one day maybe I can become a child of God. But that's not what the scriptures say. And we're not merely called, it's not just a title, but we actually are the children of God. Now we are the children of God, and since we are joined to him as his children presently, we are disjoined from the things of this world. And joined to him as the children of God, we are given this wonderful guarantee as his children. Because we are the children of God, because we have this identity, because of the love of God and receiving the gospel of the grace of God, 
We are given a new identity as the children of God, and this new identity guarantees us a future destiny. Look at what he says, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. What does that mean practically for us? And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We know what we are. We are the children of God. We don't exactly know what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What exactly is John saying? Simply this, point number four. My present standing in his love guarantees my future glory in his presence. Think about that. If you have trusted in Christ, in the gospel of grace, by God's grace, you are a child of God. That's your new identity. You are in Christ, you are a child of God. And as a child of God, that present standing in the moment, according to his grace, has guaranteed you future glory in his presence. Again, these are deep truths that they may be things that you've kind of, yeah, I've heard that before. I've been in church for a long time and I get it and I understand it. But sometimes we can so quickly pass over the reality of this and the importance of this. Paul writes about this. In Romans chapter eight, he wrote this, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When you received the gospel, you received the spirit of God and he made you a child of God whereby you now call out to God, the eternal one, the creator of all things seen and unseen. You cry out to him as Abba, Father. Now that may not mean a whole bunch to you, until you go to Israel and you hear people speak in Hebrew and you hear little children running around and calling their daddy Abba because that's the Hebrew word for daddy. Think about that. We don't relate to God as this great cosmic judge who will one day pour out wrath and we have to do all these things to appease him and make him happy because we're afraid that he's gonna destroy us. No, in Christ Jesus, we are his children. We cry out to him as Abba, Father, Daddy. So we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out to him as Abba, Father. Verse 16, Romans 8, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There, Paul says it again, just like John says, we are the children of God. And what does this mean? Verse 17, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So John here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17 says, this world is passing away. It is temporary and it is passing away. And every single one of us are well acquainted with the passing away nature of this world. You feel it in yourself every single day and more and more as you get older. And, and I recently have been reminded of this at a greater level than I, than I was in previous years because all of a sudden, my eyes don't work like they once worked. I've heard people say this for years. You know, when you get you're 40, your eyes don't work. I'll be 40 at the end of this year, and my eyes don't work. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's for you. But no, now it's me too. And not only do my eyes not work, but my hearing doesn't work. And when I get up in the morning, every step I take for about the first hundred steps sounds like every bone in my body is going to like fall apart. It's like... Like, what in the world is happening here? It's passing away. But the child of God is promised a life beyond this life and a world beyond this world. Paul talked about this in his letter to the Corinthians, and I want you to see it in the text. So I'd like you to turn with me. You're in 1 John. Turn to the left to 1 Corinthians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection passage of the Bible. And 1 Corinthians 15, 51 is where Paul clues into this, this great mystery that our present standing in his great love guarantees our future glory in his presence. And 
this is mysterious to us. It's a, it's a mystery. It's something we, we don't fully comprehend. John didn't fully comprehend. What, what does it mean? What are the particulars of that future glory, that state of future glory that the Bible talks about? What's, the, what's it actually look like? John says, I don't know. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know this. When we see him, we shall be like him. So we don't know the full particulars, but we have passages throughout the scriptures that talk about a future state beyond this life. Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. It's mysterious. And a biblical mystery is like a Christmas present. You don't know what it is until it's revealed, until it's opened. So there is a mystery about a future existence beyond this life, and we don't fully grasp what it is. And even all the writers of Scripture indicate that it's a mystery. We don't fully comprehend. But when we leave this life, we will. Because Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And he uses sleep here for die. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Transformed. Metamorphosis. I heard of one church that put this on the nursery wall. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So there's going to be a transformation. It's mysterious. We don't grasp it all. Verse 52, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, this is using prophetic language, biblical, eschatological, apocalyptic, end times language, prophetic language, at the last trumpet, what's that all about? For another day, not today. For the trumpet will sound, and what will happen? The dead, those who have slept, they will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Whether you are taken up, Before you die, the Bible indicates that there's going to be some group of followers, some group of a followers of God that when Jesus returns, they will not experience physical death. They'll just be taken up to be with the Lord. Some people refer to that as the rapture. But the dead will be raised. Those that have been put in the graves. The dead will be raised and we shall be changed, metamorphosis. For this corruptible, verse 53, must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. This is the good news of the gospel. Because of Jesus' resurrection power, one day death will be destroyed. And we will be with the Lord, and there will be a transformation that takes place. Why? Because, Paul says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. We're not of this world. Our citizenship is of heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. That sounds really good. It doesn't just sound good, that sounds glorious, to use some, you know, King James words. It's glorious. The glorious future state, nature. What are the specifics about it? What will be our exact state when we are with the Lord? We don't know. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. It's a mystery to us. We don't understand it. But because of our identity as the children of God in Christ, we have this destiny. Now realize how important this is. Because every person you know, whether they articulate it on a regular basis or not, and probably they don't, they are wrestling with these issues. Identity, purpose, origin, destiny, morality. And those who are in Christ, or I'll put it this way, and I've said it like this before, I think it's a good way to say it. The gospel, the theology presented to us in the Bible presents the most coherent answers to the questions of identity, purpose, origin, destiny, and morality. And when you begin to grasp what you have received by the grace of God in the gospel, you start to comprehend fully, not totally, but you begin to comprehend your new identity. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You receive a new identity, a new nature. And we live in a culture filled with people that are struggling to try and figure out what is my identity? I gotta find myself. How many of you have talked to someone who's told you before, I gotta, I gotta discover me? Or they say stupid things like, you just gotta be you. What on earth does that mean? Like, who am I gonna be? Him? I, what, what, on, what on earth does that? I mean, when people say absurd things like that, just say, that's dumb. 
Like, just call it for what it is. That's got to be the stupidest thing. Just gotta, you just got to do you. What? What does that mean? I don't know what it means. They don't know what it means. They just, they just heard it somewhere. They saw it hashtag. YOLO. You only live once, you know? So people are, are they're dying to find their identity and to find a place to belong, a group to be a part of. Because of that identity. They have no hope of destiny. Why? Because we have been indoctrinated, educated by a secularly oriented, humanistic, naturalistic, materialistic mindset that this is all there is. And when you die, nothing, no destiny. So why do we wonder that people have a crisis of meaning? We live in a culture filled with people that have lost purpose and have a crisis of meaning and they can't figure out where a sustaining meaning comes from. Maybe you'll find it, like Sam Harris, the atheist, says, you find it through meditation. And that's why he's put out a big meditation app and you can do it through mindfulness. Why do we see this uptick of mindfulness and meditation? Maybe I'll find meaning in that. By, by clearing your mind? I don't, I don't get it. Your meaning is going to be found in your identity in Christ from which you have this guaranteed destiny which affects and alters and changes your purpose and your meaning and your morality now. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that if our earthly house, he's using metaphor here, our earthly house, this body, this tent is destroyed. This body's gonna die. If we know that, and we all know that, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So this body's gonna die. We all have a total awareness of this every single day, and more so as time goes by. But the Christian knows because of their identity, we have a house not made with hands. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. There's a house made for you. You're made up of more than just a body, body and soul and spirit. And that soul that resides in this body it's just occupying a tent. And someday this tent, which has fallen apart and got holes in, is going to break down and die. And your soul is gone. It's no longer in this tent. And when the soul is separated from the body, separation is death. The body is dead. Now what? Well, verse 2, 2 Corinthians 5. For in this we groan. Any of you been groaning lately? In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is for heaven. We're looking forward to a body that's not broken down. Anybody say amen? Amen. amen. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking for a body that's not broken down. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. We're not just going to be naked souls wandering around in the cosmos. That's what some people teach. You just be absorbed into the consciousness of the universe. What, the, what does that mean? For, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 5, for we who are in this tent, in this body, groan. Yes, we do. Being burdened. Yes, we are. Not because we want to be unclothed. We don't want to be disembodied souls, but we want to be clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. God made you to yearn for this. Who also has given us his spirit as a guarantee. He placed his spirit in you to say, you have a guaranteed destiny as a child of God. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 6. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We're not with him. For we walk by faith and not by sight. But we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the psalmist 3,000 years ago wrote, in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, 11. So we have, as we trust in Christ, a new identity. We are the children of God. And this new identity as the children of God has guaranteed us an inheritance, a destiny, to be with God in his presence. That's our glorious destiny. And Knowing this, what we are, identity, what we shall be, destiny, it informs us and gives us a new purpose and morality. And when I say morality, I'm not just talking about doing what is right and not doing what is wrong, but the new morality, the new purpose that we have as followers of God who know our identity and we understand our destiny, the new purpose we have is to live according to the new nature. See, the morality that we have from God is to live in line with 
the new nature that he's given to us, the new identity that he's given to us. John says it like this, 1 John 3, 3. And everyone who has this hope, what hope? The hope that when we see him, we shall be like him. Everyone who has this hope does what? Purifies himself just as he is pure. Point number five. His promise of future glory compels my present purification. The absolute certainty that I have in the promise of God as his child that I will be with him in his presence and transformed. When we see him, we shall be like him. That promise of future glory stirs me to purification, present purification right now. I just read from 2 Corinthians 5, 8 that says, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The next verse says, therefore, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. And here's the difference between the Christian faith and the religions of this world. The Christian faith says that by Christ's grace and God's love, you have been given a new identity as a child of God and you have a guaranteed destiny to be with him forever. Therefore, live according to that new identity. Now, religion says you gotta really work hard to try to become a child of God. And maybe if you do it just right, then you will be accepted to be with him in his destiny. A big difference there. And this brings me back to my favorite verses in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. There Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. So we have this identity. Children of God. Now, We are the children of God. And according to God's grace, we have been adopted to be his sons and daughters, and therefore we are guaranteed an inheritance to be with him, destiny. So what do we do now? Now we are the children of God, and we are to live as the children of God in this world. Work out your own salvation. You've been saved. Work out what God has worked into you by his grace Work out your own salvation. Put some energy into it, some effort into it, with fear and trembling, knowing that God is working in you to will and to do his good pleasure. Okay, well, what does that look like practically to work out your own salvation? Philippians 2, verse 14, next verse. One of the practical things it looks like is this. Do all things without complaining and without disputing. Now, Paul, why do you have to go and say something so crazy like that? Do all things without complaining and disputing. I mean, we have like PhDs in complaining and disputing. We're scholars in that. We're good at that. And what's really amazing is we live in a nation that is perhaps more blessed than any other nation in any other period in time, and we are like experts at complaining and disputing about every possible thing. And Paul says, hey, listen, you're a child of God. You're a kid of the kingdom. You're assured a destiny beyond this world. And so you ought to live differently than the rest of this world. There is a difference between us and this world. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Why? This is the weird part. Verse 15, Philippians 2. That you may become children of God. Wait, what? I thought we are children of God. That you may be here practically what God has made you by his grace. That we may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And when we do this, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, that, you, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ Jesus that I have not labored in vain. Beloved, now we are the children of God. If you have placed your trust in Jesus, your identity has been transformed. You are a child of God by redemption. You shall be glorified in his presence one day. Right now, you are currently called to work out the nature that God has given to you by his grace in this world. That people would see it and recognize. Say, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, God will work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. Beloved, 1 John 3, 2, now we are the children of God. Therefore, let us live as his children. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer?
God, thank you for your grace that has entitled us. Sometimes we have a hard time with that word entitled in our day. We don't want to live as entitled people, but Lord, you want us to live as those who have received this great grace and this ultimate destiny. So God, would you work in us to willing to do your good pleasure today and this week and that our lives would represent in this world your will, your perfect will. God, do a work in us. That we would shine as lights in a dark world that is in such desperate need of your grace. We thank you for the identity that we have received from you. We thank you for the destiny that we have been given because of your grace. And we pray, God, that we would live according to your purpose. That we would live according to the new nature, bringing glory to you. We praise you, Jesus. Set our hearts to worship you today. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said, let's sing to you.